Okay, we'll get started. So welcome everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming out. Uh, this is the second of our speaker series for this year. Um, so we're very happy to see a great turnout today. Without further ado, uh, I can introduce our presenters for today. We've still got a couple little stragglers coming in, but that's great. <laughs> Grab a seat. Please welcome. So today's presentation uh, will be a very interesting discussion. Uh, and like I said, I'm glad to see such a great turnout uh, for our guests. Um, our topic today is titled Before and Throughout Coloniality, <laughs> um, Hod Nassani and Black Life on Wolf Island and Kingston. Uh, so I'd like to in, uh, welcome our panelists. So we have Kintila Lilla. Kanita. Kanita. Oh, see, I'm sorry. Kanita, I'm sorry. No Thank you. Kanita Lilla. She is the Associate Curator of Arts of Africa at Agnes Etherington Arts Centre in Kingston. I have Sebastian Deline. Thank you. Who is an Associate Curator of Care and Relations at Agnes Etherington Arts Centre. Sheldon Travis is a local knowledge carrier. And Al Dockstater is with the Clear Group. Where is Al? <laughs> hiding, hiding, in, hiding there, okay. Um, and then we of course have Terry Lynn Brennan, uh, who is an archeologist, educator, intercultural planner, and resident here on <coughs> Wolf Island. Sheldon and Terry, as well as Al, are representing the Cataraqui Longhouse Education and Archival Research Group, otherwise known as CLEAR. Um, please give a round of applause to our presenters. Thank you very much for including us um, in this uh, discussion. Um, when I was invited to speak, I was wondering what, what would be most useful to share um, today. And I thought that thinking about the Agnes's um, connection to Wolf Island would be very useful. Uh, black history on Wolf Island and Kingston would be most useful. Um, so that's what this is going to be about. Um, my name's Connie Talila. I'm Associate Curator Art of Africa at Agnes Etherington Art Center. I, um, part of what I do is work with a traditional collection of African art, which is about 600 pieces of three-dimensional um, objects from all over West Africa. But I also work with art from the diaspora more generally, um, artists of African heritage um, as well. So I come from South Africa, Cape Town, South Africa. I'm of mixed heritage of um, indigenous Asian and Dutch and all sorts of, like we've got a rich slave history in South Africa um, as well. So there's a lot of similarities that I have with um, many people that are here in Kingston. Uh, so without um, kind of rambling on, I'm going to talk about this really incredible project that we did that intersected with life in, um, on Wolf Island and that Chris Brown is hiding behind somebody over there was also like very much involved in um, and that was very special to us because of the people of Wolf Island and because of the relationships that we cultivated um, here and that was made possible um, during our time. So it was called the um, Illicit Gin Institute Assembly Number no. 6. We collaborated with a um, Nigerian British artist called Zina Sarawiwa, who, whose practice is based on finding fellowship in um, various localities, finding fellowship and thinking about what this means, thinking about the relationship to the land, her relationship to people. Um, and so what we did was she spent, she had a residency period um, with us at um, the Agnes where we took her around to meet local knowledge keepers. She was very interested in um, an indigenous relationship with the land 
because of her own relationship to her land in the Niger Delta. So we tried to find synergies in that way um, and she met incredible people, like really wonderful um, people. Then she came to um, Wolf Island. So th this is what started me on the journey to think about um, black history uh, in Kingston. And then it, it kind of happened, you know, it emerged that there was a, a rich history here um, on Wolf Island as well. But this was the project uh, that started it. So during her residency in uh, February 2023, um, Zina Sarawiwa conducted a period of active research in Kingston and Wolf Island. She met indigenous food sovereignty activists on Highway 15, visited the indigenous, Kingston indigenous language nest, went botanical foraging with indigenous knowledge keepers, and attempted tapping birch sap on Wolf Island, which was, was it successful? It, was it successful? Uh, I got some, I got some birch, okay. um, sap. Yeah. <laughs> cool. It was, it was very cold. It, it was good. Yeah. Uh, Bruce Horn allowed us to tap some birch trees on his head. Oh. Um, yes. So the idea was to celebrate local knowledges as well as new bonds of commonality and fellowship. Um, with the aim of blending various elements from the Niger Delta with Kingston and Wolf Island localities in a performance. And that's a performance in Hotel Wolf Island, um, which was very successful in March. Uh, she also had a dance, Deirdre McDermott um, danced a mask as part of a you know, masquerade performance there. So the... Um, the acknowledgement of the assembly was about local storytelling and medicinal botanicals of black Canadian entrepreneurial history that emerged during this research um, process. Uh, that's embedded both in Kingston and here. And many things came from acknowledging this history on Wolf Island, where there's a long standing farming history, but also a much longer history of indigenous occupation, as well as ties to the Underground Railroad, which I found very interesting. The first um, mention of the Underground Railroad was in a book um, by a academic from Queens that was published in 1952 called Kingston, the King's Town by James A. Roy. And he, he, was a, he was not a historian, he was a English professor. So a lot of um, his narrative style is very storytelling-like. And some of, the, um, some of the references were difficult to um, find. But we s kind of found out that just local knowledge, people have stories of a sense of um, the Underground Railroad being here and the fact that there were safe houses um, on the island. So what I'm going to do now is take you through the journey um, that I had through the archives. So these are different like archival um, photographs that gave me a sense or that started to make me make it possible to imagine a black presence here. Um, this was an early photograph, 1874. Um, and it would have been of somebody in the foreground standing looking towards um, Kingston. And I thought this was really interesting, the idea of somebody on the outside, on the island, looking at this wedding cake of a town hall. And many, many um, photographs of this time have the town hall as the focal point. And what I'm much more interested in are the things that we find on the edges, the things that are incidental, um, because that is where a black presence exists, because it was never in the center. It was never the center of um, a story. And when it was in the center, it exists in a different kind of way. Okay. And then this was, I used this as a conversation article that I wrote about um, a black presence in Kingston. Also, like thinking about um, 
people turning away, people's backs, who are the, f you know, things that we do not know because there's so much of the historical record that we do not know that is absent. And we're trying to knit together bits and pieces of a incomplete historical record a record that, was, that never acknowledged um, this presence uh, in Kingston. Although it also, there's also a, um, a sense that there are archival records you know, of businesses, of black businesses, and that's how we found a way in. Um, a, yeah, an entrepreneurial record, many, many saloons were um, owned by black businesses. There was a um, piano um, business, uh, so you know, it was definitely it was definitely there. Actually, even more so than than today. Okay. So then again, like um, this was corner of Brock and Ontario, just behind um, City Hall, and having to look really closely at the people in a different kind of unintended way. Um, it was a military parade, you know, thinking about what people wore, who the people were that were busy parading, who the people were not, who the people, you know, who were the people that were um, not included in this story. And then we found Tobias Mink, um, who, and George Mink, so th this, uh, George Mink was this um, individual who, whose father was enslaved um, and who came to Kingston, they had a property, Herkimer, um, had a property in Le Moyne Point, um, and he came with his enslaved um, property, in uh, quotation marks. Um, George Mink then became a very prosperous business owner in um, Kingston. Him, he was one of 11 uh, children, and this is his nephew who moved to um, Napanee. And it was, it's very interesting. Just this photograph of the only thing that they say is that it, he's a cartman. And we don't know exactly what that means. But we, looking at him, we can see that he's a laborer. Uh, we can see that you know, his, his clothes are worn. And he sits with a bottle of um, alcohol. And I was. I looked at the whole, the whole archival record of these photographs by Stephen Manson Benson, and they're about 500 photographs. None of them look like this. All of them look like that. And yet, it's exactly the same props. It's the same um, carpet, tablecloth, table. So I kind of wondered what made Mr. Tobias Mink sit in this position? What made him lower his gaze? What made him sit with his pipe? Um, and for me, it's a kind of form of resistance to not get dressed up, to not stand like that, to not stand in this Victorian way. And this is the kind of Victorian standard of these studio photographs. Um, and studio photography at that time was burgeoning in Kingston. Um, the earliest um, studios were on the street, and they would just put them up quickly. And it also made me think of my own um, history worth of studying photography and studying indigenous photography of South Africa and um, how people showed resistance in that. How they would not, how would, how they would refuse to look at the photo, at the um, person taking the uh, photo. How they would refuse to smile, you know, um, all, all these kinds of acts of resistance and what that meant at that time. And then, um, so yeah, Sebastian and Emily and Philip were all part of an archival team that went into Queen's Archive to um, tackle this, the, the archival record. Um, and these were the strings. We found many, many strings of um, information, uh, incredible information. Even though there were these large gaps, there was this proliferation of presence 
Um, and one of the ways that we brought this forth was to um, write poetry in the wig. So publish it on the front page of the wig um, as a form of remembrance because we, that, were, that was where we found most of our evidence. So that in a hundred years people could see we engaged with this somehow um, and this was a this is an acrostic poem people saloon was one of the um, there's the story about uh, James and Maria Elder who were also black Kingstonites whose, whose um, saloons kept burning down periodically uh, and they had to keep rebuilding. And we found um, letters to the editor in the newspaper uh, of them thanking their neighbors, thanking their neighbors for coming, uh, coming together and rebuilding with them. And this, this was the name, People Saloon was the name of their last um, saloon and we wanted to celebrate that and um, remember that. So all these acrostic poems had to, uh, we used People Saloon but the main themes, you know, that we explored and found out about in the um, archive, we kind of worked through in this way. So this, this is about um, the Underground Railroad and the way people um, left America and came um, through to Canada. So here, yeah, yeah, came specifically, yeah to safe houses on Wolf Island. Yeah, and that's one to um, George Mink. Political, oh yes, oh yeah. Yeah, it kind of goes on and on, hey? Eh? Yeah. Um, so uh, George Mink was, um, he was very almost uh, elected as alderman um, at the time of J.A. MacDonald. So as J.A. MacDonald was leaving, he was going to, um, you know, uh, go into that position. He would have been the very first um, black Canadian to be in that uh, role. But there was some intrigue, some kind of political intrigue that f stopped it. And it all kind of played out in the newspaper because of like, letters to the editor. Um, and eventually he bowed out. Um, yeah, so so this is just an, an ode to him. So, yeah, that's all I have to share. But it continues. The research project continues, and we um, hope to. Well, we will. We'll continue it. We are calling ourselves the People Saloon to continue to do this work of forgotten histories. Thank you.